Welcome back to another episode of History in Your Own Backyard. I'm your host, Susie Selleck, and today we are at the Council Chambers in Poland, Ohio. I'm joined by Rebecca Rogers. Rebecca, thank you for joining us. Good to be here. Yeah, and also president of the Ohio Historic Bridge Association, David Simmons. David, thank you for being here. Glad to be here. So we are going to be talking in this episode about the White Bridge, and I understand that this name goes by a few other names. Rebecca, can you tell us about that? Sure. This bridge is also known as the Morse Bridge and the Cemetery Bridge, because it goes to the cemetery, and the Riverside Drive Bridge. Very nice. So Rebecca, what can you tell us about this White Bridge? Uh, the bridge is old, uh, hundred and f about 140 years old. And it is uh, nationally and locally and statewide significant, but unfortunately, locally, not particularly appreciated. And that is a reason why we're looking at it today. David, what else can you tell us about the bridge? Well, the White Bridge is what's called an iron bowstring bridge, which is a design in that's especially was popular in the Mahoning Valley because of all the extensive iron production, so it was a logical material to use. Mm -hmm. Plus, you could also produce a very strong structure using a relatively low amount of material, so it was a very efficient material, which is kind of a hallmark of, a, of American engineering. So it made a lot of sense in Mahoning Valley in particular to use iron bowstrings, and they, they became very popular during the Civil War and after. Um, this particular bridge was built in 1877, so it's uh, a little bit after the Civil War. But uh, it stretches for uh, 127 feet, so it's a fairly long structure as far as iron bowstrings go. Um, and the main structure itself, I'm talking about iron bowstrings, I, I should explain what that is. It's much like the bow in a bow and arrow when you have an arch uh, of the the uh, structure and then the string. I mean, if you turn it on the side, it looks like the bow and a bow and arrow. And there are two forces uh, that act on the bridge when any kind of traffic crosses it. One pushes the material together, that's said to be compression, and one pulls the material apart, that's said to be intention. So in an arch, in a bowstring, iron bowstring, you can actually see those two things very visually because the arch is the main compression member, it's being pushed together and the string uh, is the lower cord that's being pulled apart. So it's, it's very visually, you can actually see what's happening in, in, a, in a bow string. Gotcha. Now you talked about the length um, and how that's it's, it's pretty long. Is that what you would say is different with the white bridge compared to other iron bow strings or are there more differences? No, the main difference with the white bridge is the size or the, the shape of the tube itself, which is, is an oval. Uh, which is very distinctive. It has an, two, two rolled plates, one on the top, one on the bottom, and then a plate in the middle. And there's really, this is the only bridge in Ohio that's like this, and it's one of the very few in the entire country that's like that. Um, and it uh, required technology to be able to, a certain type of technology to be able to roll out these big sheets of, of wrought iron. And that really became uh, really refined and developed during the Civil War when they were using plate iron to like uh, put armor on ships and then make an entire ship out of wrought iron like the USS Monitor. So who invented the tubular bowstring design? The White Bridge is based on an 1867 patent that was given to three men from Cleveland. Uh, two of them were from the iron industry, a guy named John Glass and George Schneider. But the third man, William B. Resner, was actually a physician. And that may seem odd, but physicians were generally well-educated people uh, in the 19th century. So it's not necessarily that unusual that he might become interested in, in technology. And he uh, provided a patent model. A lot of, a lot of uh, patents at that time would actually have a, a miniature of their design that would give the patent examiners and the examiners an opportunity to see what it looked like in three dimensions, which is what happened in this case. And Resner's patent model is part of the collections of the Smithsonian Institution. So it's, it, it has some uh, 
pieces that have been lost from it, but it's still remarkable that this artifact still exists. So what did William Resner do with that invention? Resner then uh, created a bridge company called the Ohio Bridge Company that uh, operated for a very short time. Uh, and it's surprising, um, his, his design was a really good, efficient design, and that's actually one of the reasons that it didn't last very long, oddly enough. <laughs> okay. So it didn't last very long, but what happened to the Ohio Bridge Company? It was actually taken over by a, a Canton firm called the Wrought Iron Bridge Company, which was really a, a, a major firm in terms of, of uh, iron bridge building in the United States, all across the United States. What, what made them so powerful? Well, they, had, they were founded by a man named David Hammond, who had been a carpenter and became a, a bridge builder. But he got the idea of sending agents all across the country. And these might be stonemasons that were interested in building the, the substructure, the, the stone supports under a bridge, um, and were willing to work with a firm that was building the superstructure. Or they might have just been sort of uh, local entrepreneurs that were willing to represent some, some distant company. But they became very uh, uh, extensive all across the country, these wrought iron bridge company agents. So if the wrought iron bridge company was so influential, were there, others, were there other key players that contributed to this as well? Well, the wrought iron bridge company really came into its own when Job Abbott uh, got involved with the company. He had uh, been trained at Harvard at the Lawrence Scientific School and came to Canton uh, to actually uh, serve as a patent attorney. He studied law uh, as well as engineering. And that's how he got to know David Hammond and was representing Hammond in uh, patent filings. And then eventually became the chief engineer of the company and was w the one really responsible for the, the wide variety and, and the, the sort of the scientific uh, quality of the Rod Iron Bridge Company's designs. And there were few uh, communities across, you know, Canada, United States, Mexico, that uh, didn't have wrought iron bridge company uh, structures on their highways. So it became a really powerful firm from that point of view. So you can see that Resner's company, you know, was a very small company in Cleveland. It really didn't have much chance uh, against such such a sort of a mega firm right. in ter terms of bridge building. Um, but it's really a credit to the quality of Resner's design that this big firm was interested in his design. And it, sometime in 1871, they actually took over the, uh, the patent rights and, and the company itself took over all their contracts and that sort of thing. There are a few contracts that the Ohio Bridge Company built, but by far the majority of them were wrought iron bridge company, like the White Bridge here in Poland, was actually built by the Wrought Iron Bridge Company. Uh, so what happened to William Resner? Like, you know, once the, uh, that all happened, and I mean, did, did he join up with them? Did he do his own thing? No, actually he went back to be, being a physician in uh, downtown Cleveland. You know, on, he was a physician on the square. But he still did tink some tinkering. So it's not clear what the arrangements were between Ohio Bridge Company and the Wrought Iron Bridge Company, because he still uh, continued to do some tinkering and actually came out with another patent on this in 1872 that had to do with the way the the arch itself and the string came together. Um, as you can imagine, bringing uh, a, a uh, iron rod and a tubular uh, structure together in an arch, you know, how do you put those two together? So that was it was a refinement of that that design, which the White Bridge actually has, has, has that 1872 uh, patent design in it, too. So, Rebecca, this White Bridge is, is black now. How do you explain that? And, and why, is it, why was it named the White Bridge? White, uh, it was called the White Bridge because, indeed, it was painted white. And the reason it was painted white is so that you can see that it, when it rusts, that you can see the bleeding of the rust through the white paint. 
And uh, there was a fellow, Alfred P. Bowler, who wrote a book on uh, bridge construction shortly before the production of this bridge. And he very specifically asked or recommended that bridges be painted light colors for this issue. And uh, in, in my heart, I think it was white to celebrate how important a bridge you know, this new exciting design of a bridge. But indeed, um, black bridges are uh, what, to make it disappear into the background and to see where you're going, not what you're actually looking at. Now, it has other names, and Morse Bridge is where it was located. Um, uh, Henry G. Morse was a new, freshly minted, uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic engineer, and he worked for the Rhode Island Bridge Company in Canton, and it's probably his recommendation that there needed to be a new bridge on this important road that went between Struthers and Newcastle. And therefore, it's called the Morse Bridge. Uh, the postcard that we see, we're actually looking at the Morse house across the bridge. Um, and and the Morse family had owned and had mills at that site where the bridge is uh, from about 1815. So they'd been a prominent family in town. Gotcha. So it's so the location, the, also AKA Morse Bridge, it's, it's due to the location. Is there any other reasons why maybe it's called the Morse Bridge? Well, um, Morse continued to be a bridge engineer and actually started the Morse Bridge Company here in Youngstown shortly after leaving Rhode Iron Bridge. Rebecca, have any efforts been made to officially document the White Bridge? Yes, in the 1980s, 1983, um, a YSU student wrote a National Register nomination for the bridge. The National Register is a, a listing of the significant local, state, and national sites buildings, et cetera, um, and those um, set aside and celebrate what is important to a community, a state, a region, so forth. And then it has um, also been, uh, David knows more about and has drawings uh, to discuss on the, uh, it, it continued being um, recognized in, oh. in the 1980s. Right. Yeah, so the Ohio Historic Bridge Association, what is the what is the specific interest there? Well, the uh, actually it was a national organization that I, uh, that recognized the bridge in terms of preparing some drawings. The Historic American Engineering Record uh, is, a policy, is a program of the National Park Service, and their materials uh, include drawings, photographs, and often detailed histories. And this is all deposited at the Library of Congress. And the White Bridge was part of that program in 1986, uh, and ext extensive documentation was, was done of it. And there's really only one other bridge in the U.S. that is like the, the White Bridge, and that's one at Taronda, New York. And uh, that one has actually been taken out of service uh, the images that we have are on its original site, but it's been taken out of service, and there's no, apparently there's no plans to put it back in use. So in terms of people being able to see this particular type of, of oval bowstring, uh, iron bowstring, you know, Poland, Ohio is really the only one around. All right. So, David, why is the Ohio Historic uh, Bridge Association specifically interested in the White Bridge? Well, as you can, as you've heard, this is really a very rare structure, and uh, it's the type of structure that we want to emphasize. The organization has been trying to support local efforts to uh, repaint the bridge, maybe restore it to its its original white color, which would be pretty exciting yeah. from from our standpoint. Um, but the the Ohio Historic Bridge Association really got started in 1960 to save a specific covered bridge in Muskingum County. And uh, over the years, we realized that there are, are many more historic structures than just wooden bridges that uh, deserve recognition. And uh, we promote uh, stone bridges, steel bridges, concrete bridges, all kinds of historic structures. Um, but you can see with 
all the local attention that's been directed at the White Bridge. It's really something that, that we want to support, and it really deserves uh, consideration and preservation. Thank you for watching another episode of History in Your Own Backyard. Today we were in Poland, Ohio, here in the council chambers. Remember, travel, travel slowly, slowly and, and stop, stop often. often. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.